With the blood of the terror, Maximilien Robespierre has rescued the revolution. An invigorated army is repelling attacks at the border, and internal dissent has been all but crushed. At the height of his success, Robespierre dreams up a loftier goal yet, to use more terror to mold a new kind of society, a republic of virtue. By virtue, he means civic virtue. It's an active principle for Robespierre. For example, you cannot be a virtuous citizen by simply obeying the laws and keeping your head down. You must actively be involved in the work of the state, and that includes for Robespierre destroying the enemies of the state. On February 5th, 1794, Robespierre gives a speech outlining his philosophy. Terror without virtue is disastrous. But virtue without terror is powerless. He associates terror with virtue. Terror at that moment becomes in his thinking an instrument by which you create virtue. But others disagree. For Danton, the revolution is heading down the wrong path. He and his followers, the Dantonists, believe it is time to bring the terror to a halt. It has served its purpose is in danger of feeding the revolutionaries into their own fire. By the spring of 1794, things are beginning to go better. The, the food situation is no longer so bad, and the war effort is going better, and Danton is, is basically saying, we need to get a new footing for the government. We need to move to a kind of normalization. Robespierre believes it's too soon. Danton will start organizing a group to argue that we should end the terror. Robespierre will see this as a direct threat to the government. He will not see it as just a difference of opinion about the direction of policy. He will see it as potential treason. And in Robespierre's Republic of Virtue, there is only one response to treason. The Dantonists are rounded up and quickly sentenced to death. Robespierre has sent thousands to the scaffold, but is uneasy with the blood of execution. He will not attend the beheadings of his former friends and allies. As he steps up to the blade, Danton shouts, My only regret is that I'm going before that rat, Robespierre. With the Dantonists out of the way, Robespierre launches France into an even bloodier, more horrifying period. The Great Terror. The Great Terror is the name given to the last phase of the terror in the spring of 1794 into the summer of 1794. It's the period at which the tempo of, ex of executions really starts to increase, at which the atmosphere of paranoia, particularly in Paris, but really across the country, starts to increase exponentially. You can track the number of executions until it's up to almost 800 per month in Paris towards the end, even more. Paris's executioner is busier than ever. But on June 6, 1794, the roll of the carts comes to a halt. The guillotine hangs silent. Robespierre has declared a new religious holiday, the Festival of the Supreme Being. He wants to replace the old Catholic god with a new one, the goddess of reason. One thing about Robespierre is that he never supported these atheist policies. He believed that people needed a divinity to believe in. And he helped sponsor this cult that was called the Cult of the Supreme Being with this extraordinary tableau in Paris in, I believe it was June of 1794, which had choirs of people dressed in white singing. You had this kind of paper mache mountain that was built in the center of Paris. And then at the critical moment of the ceremony, you had Robespierre himself sort of emerging on the top of this mountain, clad in a toga, and marching down. And I think at this moment, a lot of people felt all right, uh, who does he really think he is? Does he think he's God here? Does he think he's the king? As the great terror spirals on, Robespierre's colleagues see the festival of the supreme being as his departure from the realm of reality. There are those who think that Robespierre really has reached so extreme and, and so unreasonable a position that he can't turn back, that his fanaticism has somehow overtaken him. And there are those who think he's just gone nuts. Once again, Robespierre's suspicions turn to those closest at hand. On June 27th, now the 9th of Thermidor, 
he appears before the convention and delivers a speech of threats. It is the last speech he will ever give. Rossier makes a tactical error. He comes in and announces that he has a new list of enemies of the Republic, but he won't give the list. Therefore, everyone is afraid they might be on the list, and when he comes back the next day to give the list, he is arrested before he can speak. An unexpected chorus of voices shouts Robespierre down. He is stunned into silence. The deputies declare him an outlaw and immediately remove him from the convention. Robespierre and several of his associates are taken to City Hall, where they remain under watch for the night. Shots ring out in the early morning. Guards race to the second floor. They fling the doors open to a grisly scene. One of Robespierre's allies has thrown himself from the window. Another has taken a pistol to his head. And Robespierre is found semi-conscious with a bullet wound to the face, his jaw shattered from an apparent suicide attempt. Robespierre spends his last hours on the table of the Committee of Public Safety in the very room where he had piloted the terror to its hideously bloody peak. As he is ridiculed and insulted by his former colleagues, Robespierre is unable to respond. The Grand Master of Oratory has been silenced. In the Conciergerie, where the last Queen of France had preceded him, Robespierre is prepared for the national razor. His cellmate, the revolutionary Saint-Just, points to a painting of the rights of man and declares, at least we did that. Robespierre had spearheaded a revolution and changed the face of France. He had reordered society and engineered a bloody and tyrannical system to ensure its success. But he was destined to be one of its final victims. It turns out that there is a great deal of enthusiasm for ending the terror. Nobody can figure out how to do it. And what turns out to be the case is that the only thing that will end the terror, and apparently the only thing they can all agree upon, is the fall of Robespierre. On July 27, 1794, the guillotine comes down on the incorruptible. And the last blood of the terror is shed. The terror dies with Robespierre, but the revolution does not. The rights of man, democracy, the new republic, the accomplishments of the revolution would far outlive any of the revolutionaries themselves. France would enter a period of uncertainty, frozen between fear of another terror, or worse yet, a return to the oppressive monarchy that preceded it. Five stagnant years would pass before power once again consolidated in the hands of a single man, Napoleon Bonaparte. Historians disagree over the end of the revolution. Some believe it died with the rise of Napoleon. Others maintain that the revolution lived on into the 19th century and beyond. The revolution was the first and enduring model of a people taking its destiny in its own hands. The idea that the subjects of the oldest, the most established, the most glorious monarchy in Europe could decide to completely rewrite their history was something that had extraordinary resonance. The revolution tore apart the old feudal fabric of Europe and forever changed the course of Western civilization. The question raised by the French Revolution is how much violence is justified in achieving a better society? Do people have the right to overthrow what they see as an unjust system, to replace it with what they are convinced in their hearts is a more just system? How much violence is justified in doing that? We still face this question today. As Robespierre and his colleagues were driving their country into the future, many of them 
must have wondered what the final outcome would be. More than 200 years after the birth of the French Republic, the ghost of Robespierre hangs over revolutions from Russia to Vietnam, China to Latin America. The French experiments with democracy have inspired models all over the world. Wherever tyranny takes root, the cry for justice is eternal, for liberty, equality, fraternity, for revolution.